Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again for another day just to be alive and to come together like this in the unity of the faith as your adopted children by grace through faith and not by works so that no man can boast before you. Father, we pray for all of our family here at North Christian Church, including those right now that just can't be here for some reason. And we ask that you uh, help them know that we're with them in spirit and give them courage and faith to go on in whatever their test and their battle is right now. And we thank you, Father, for your word and your spirit and even for getting your word out in the ways that you do so that even those who can't be here can hear your word and be up to date and be with us. And Father, most of all, we're grateful and thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who paid the way for our, our entire salvation once for all, so that whoever trusts in him from the heart will be saved. Father, we ask that you bless this message that you guide us tonight by your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes so that we can see and we can differentiate light from darkness and that we can know your ways instead of our own ways. We ask these things in the name of our precious Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, and it's by the power of your Spirit we pray. Amen. Okay, a little aside from the Spirit as we open up this evening. Happy New Year. On the first day of January 2019, I can't believe it myself. I don't know if you can, but some of you thought the rapture was coming in Y2K. and We'd never make it this far. But here we are. The Lord tarries. It's all up to Him. But uh, the great thing about a new year, just like each and every new day, is that it ushers in the chance to forget about our past failures and to look ahead to better things. Uh, it's an opportunity, really, to, you know, reset maybe where we are, to start over. So no matter what our past failures are, or, or even this past year, if you had a quote-unquote bad year, the Lord is with the humble. He's always with the humble. And if we go forward asking for His help, He will give it. That's just what He does. That's who He is. As long as we have a repentant heart, for example, He's there with us. He's ready to go forward. Let's go. So this is a good time to share a couple of verses on the topic of looking ahead, uh, which you may be familiar with, but this might be the right time to grab a hold of these with an attitude of faith and personalize it for your own walk with Christ. So let's start by opening up in uh, Philippians 3.13. Turn to Philippians 3.13. The year of our Lord, 2019. I always like to um, put it that way with people when I have the chance to remind them that the very calendar we have is based on the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, this might be the right time for you to grab hold of these verses as we look ahead to this new year that God has allowed you to be alive for another year. So by default, He has a plan for your life if you're still here. Philippians 3.13 Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And this is a mental thing, folks, right? This is a mental attitude that you choose to have. I'm going to reach forward to what lies ahead. I'm not going to look behind anymore. So, again, this is an opportunity with the new year. And then Paul says in verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call 
of God in Christ Jesus. Do you? Will you? Maybe some of you needed to hear this right now at this very moment. But look at Paul's attitude. And will you by faith embrace the same attitude? Turn to Lamentations 3.21. Lamentations 3.21. It's a new year. It's an opportunity to forget about this past year. At least the things that, you know, dragged you down. And God can always uh, change us. God can sanctify us more and more if we're humble. As we'll see that theme coming up again tonight. Lamentations 3.21 This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I have hope in Him. May we never forget His compassions are new every morning. Right? That would be a horrible thing to forget. His compassions, His grace, His mercy is new and fresh every single morning. Same idea with the new year, but every day we can have this attitude, this proper attitude of reaching forward to what lies ahead. God's grace gives all who turn to Him a fresh start with forgiveness of sins and new power available from His Spirit to go forward in His victory. And may this year, 2019, be the year we all bring the Lord the most glory in our entire lives so far. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. What matters is you're still alive, and this year we could, by faith, by grace, bring God the most glory we've ever brought Him in our lives. And may this year be the year that we're not mastered by anything except by the Master Himself. Remember this verse from a couple weeks ago on the board, 1 Corinthians 6.12? Paul said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Is that your decision for the new year? It starts with a decision. By faith, I will not be mastered by anything. I'm tired of being mastered by anything and, you know, bringing shame to the Lord with my life in certain areas. I will not be mastered by anything. As we learn about the deceitfulness of sin, God will deliver us from the domination of sin in our lives and instead will be dominated by the Holy Spirit. How awesome would that be if on December 31st you can look back on this year and say that? You know what? I submitted to the Holy Spirit. He dominated my life this year instead of being dominated by sin. May this be the year we listen to and follow the Spirit's convictions within us more than any other year so far. Amen? It's an opportunity. And that's what's so exciting about this study we're on. When we uncover the enemy's devices and refuse to buy his lies anymore, we will no longer live in the subtle deceptions Satan wants us to live in. We'll no longer be slaves to sin, in other words, experientially. And we can enjoy the peace and love of God each and every day, bringing God tremendous glory with our lives instead of bringing glory to ourselves. So back to our main subject. We started out on Sunday remembering the conversation in the Garden of Eden. Uh, turn again to Genesis 3, verse 9. That's the first book in the Bible. 
That was a joke. I hope that it was. Jeez. <laughs> Somebody listening is like, that wasn't a joke. That was good. Thank you. I needed that. Genesis 3, 9. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And the question came up on Sunday, what is going on there? There's a lot going on right there. Why did the man say what he said? And what did he mean? Where was his soul at that point? On the board, we saw from the total depravity of man regarding Genesis 3.10. If the words of Adam in Genesis 3.10 are carefully pondered, a solemn and fatal omission from them will be observed. He said nothing about his sin, but mentioned only the painful effects which it had produced. As another has said, this was the language of impenitent misery. Isn't it interesting that Adam didn't mention his sin? Like if it was you, let's say, you know, God caught you red-handed kind of thing, which kind of is what happened, right? God's walking in the garden. Where are you, Adam? What's going on? Wouldn't you have kind of said, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm guilty. I did it. But no. Adam's first instinct was to hide it, to hide his guilt. Maybe because we're believers, we know that, right? That's the first thing we should do. Just, you know. Confess your sin to God. Apologize. You know he knows everything anyway. But this was Adam's first experience under the domination of sin. Was not a believer at this very moment when this happened. And what did sin do? It hid even the admission of guilt. Adam mentioned the painful results of his sin without mentioning his sin. And he chose to not agree with God on its source which was his own sinful disobedience against God's word. Again, look at verse 10. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. As came out on Sunday on the board, do you see the very nature of sin already present in the soul of our forefather Adam? Do you see the deception he was under? He was under the influence of sin. It's not a bad way to think about it. We use that term in our society, you know, with drugs or alcohol being under the influence. He was under the influence of sin. It took him over at that time. Sin grabbed a hold of him. So much so that he was not concerned with offending God, but he was concerned with his own discomfort and dissatisfaction. So again, on the board, do you see in this verse the very nature of sin already present in the soul of our forefather, Adam? Do you see the deception he was under and that he was under the influence of sin? Sin makes us hyper-focus on self, often putting us into a pity party, even if we're the ones that caused it. That's the irony of it all. Often the nature of sin will convince you to believe anything besides taking the blame. I know we all have been through this ourselves, living in denial. On the board, again from the total depravity of man, we saw this on Sunday also. The chief objective of the fallen sons of men is to quiet their guilty consciences and to stand well with their neighbors. Hence, so many of the unregenerate assume the garb of religion. That's really well stated. Sin might ask, how can I put myself in a good light? I know, I'll get religious. I can get religious with the best of them. You know, I can match up that way. That's what sin says to us rather than facing the music, rather than being honest about our own sin against God. Again, on the board, the chief objective of the fallen sons of men is to quiet their guilty consciences and to stand well with their neighbors. Then they think they're all set. 
Hence, so many of the unregenerate assume the garb of religion. Deep down, I know I'm wrong, but if I can just measure myself by my neighbors, I won't look that bad and I'll fit right in. So now I'm under self-deception that everything's okay and I could ignore my conscience because at least I've done something. That's religion. That's what the sin nature rallies for us to dive into in our souls. Push it all aside. Push the truth aside. You're not all that bad. Grab onto religion so that you can get on a works program and tip the scales just enough so your conscience can relax and you can even continue in your lifestyle that you want to continue in that you know is against God. That's one strategy of Satan and his agent, which is sin. Think about it. Satan is the father and founder of sin the first one to rebel against God in all of history. And he's also called in Holy Scripture, the father of lies. Anyone who is under sin and refuses to turn to Christ remains under their father, the devil. And that includes remaining under sin. And that might sound harsh, especially to someone who isn't into the word, right? even a believer or even certain religious people, that might sound kind of harsh. But that's the deception sin keeps us under. Where un people are unknowingly, when they're under sin and refuse to repent and turn to Christ, they're un unknowingly under the wing of Satan. You know, I said to some guy the other day, I was talking about a certain religion, and I came out and said to him, it's evil. And he was like, whoa, I can't go that far. But that's because you think of evil as the obvious evil stuff, right? Like murder or something, right? Evil is when something appears as good and is false, right? Evil is when something puts on a good front and it's a lie. That's evil. In fact, that, in a way, that's more evil because it's deceptive. But people don't want to hear that. But that's really what evil looks like. Satan is an angel of light, disguises himself as an angel of light. So back to the garden. Were it not for God's grace reaching out to Adam and the woman, they would have remained under sin forever, under the deception of sin forever. But they accepted God's sacrifice for them, as we can see if we keep reading on in Genesis 3. But back to one of Satan's strategies. And his agent, sin, he desires creatures to grab onto religion so they can get on a works program and tip the scales just enough so their consciences can relax and ignore the whole truth. That's the quote-unquote beauty of religion, and I'm being facetious. That's what is beautiful to the sin nature about religion. And therefore, you can fool yourself which a lot of people in this world do. Just let me keep fooling myself. I don't want to face the truth. I want to live my life, my way. And if I go into religion, I can justify it. Just enough to be at some level of peace. So you fall for the deceitfulness of sin and live in a false reality. Unfortunately, that's what the majority of the world is trapped in right now. That's the darkness that they think is light. Religion. Some kind of religious system. Relying on religiosity to satisfy God. That could be the greatest deception, the greatest darkness in this world. Relying on religiosity to satisfy God. And that's why the Lord sends us all out as evangelists to seek and save the lost. Because they're lost and they don't know it, right? They think their religious system is good enough and they literally have blinders on they literally have scales on their eyes thinking it's good when it's evil so we were encouraged on sunday by our pastor to examine ourselves regularly looking for areas where our enemies can exploit us when's the last time you did that 
you know, instead of um, just doing what you think you should do, right? Coming to class or reading the blog or reading your Bible and, and then um, not even thinking about it, not even contemplating it for yourself. When's the last time you looked for areas where your enemies can exploit you or have been exploiting you last year, which is now in the past, by the way? Where does sin or its tentacles often take advantage of me? That's a really productive question to ask, if you're willing. Where does sin or its tentacles often take advantage of me? Remember, on the board, and again, this came out on Sunday, the sin nature wants to do what Adam first did. Look at the external results, the difficulties, the strain of life itself, and then, incredibly, it goes so far to turn on God. That's what the sin nature wants us to do like Adam did. And I personally had an area in my life that I was subtly blaming God for, asking God why. Let's face it, when we ask God why, it's usually not out of faith. It's out of doubt, right? Or anger or um, some kind of unholy dissatisfaction. So during Sunday's message, which, you know, if you were listening, should have hit you right between the eyes to some degree. I personally had an area in my life that I was subtly blaming God for, and I was asking God why. But after Sunday's lesson, I was able to see, and that's kind of the whole point, right? God opening our spiritual eyes to see what's really going on in our lives and in our soul and in our motivation. I was able to see the current results in my life are from my own sin, from my own disobedience to God over the years. So once again, God is asking us to simply be honest with Him and with ourselves. That's been a recurring theme for a while now. But on the board, sin wants to get your eyes on the external results and the pain you're in, rather than discovering the cause and being set free by agreeing with God on the matter. This is going to come up a little bit later too, but this is what sin wants to do. This is one of sin's strategies. Sin wants to get your eyes on the external results and the pain you're in rather than being objective, stepping back and looking at the big picture, rather than discovering the cause for your pain and being set free by agreeing with God on the matter. For example, taking responsibility for your own actions over the years, as opposed to asking God why. And that's where freedom comes. Turn again to uh, Proverbs 19.3. Proverbs 19.3. See, sin doesn't want you to discover the cause. Sin doesn't want you to know the truth, not not the whole truth. Because sin doesn't want you to be free. It wants you to stay in bondage. Proverbs 19.3 The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. Now, if you think about it, that makes no sense. That's not even logical. The foolishness of man ruins his way. So you ruined your own way by your foolish actions. And then your heart rages against the Lord. That doesn't make any sense. But here's the question. When are we being dominated by sin? Or when we all, when you just apply it to yourself, when you're dominated by sin in a certain area... How, how we act, does that ever make sense? How we think, how we rationalize, do we ever honestly make sense? When we're trying to stay in what we want to stay in and justify it? If you think about it, there's no objective honesty. Instead, there's rationalization that any objective person from the outside can see you're falling into. Sound familiar? 
I mean, you, you've done it to other people, right? When you could see someone going down a path and staying in a, a, down a certain road, and objectively you can see exactly the pit they're falling into and they can't see it. Well, guess what? That happens to you sometimes. You're the one walking down a path that you don't realize or unwilling to admit, and everyone else can see it because they're objective. And you can't see it because you're subjective. You can't see it because you think the darkness you're walking in is light. Or you choose to turn a blind eye to the truth of the situation. And this is hard stuff. This is hard reality. It's like, are you willing to go to God and be honest about your habits, your decisions in the past? Are you willing to take responsibility for the results that have now come in your life possibly? say, you know what, if I'm really honest, that's because of this pattern I ha I've had, possibly over years. So again, look at Proverbs 19.3. The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. Here's what Pink said on this verse we saw on Sunday. This is one of the vilest forms in which human depravity manifests itself. That after deliberately playing the fool and discovering that the way of transgressors is hard, we murmur against God instead of meekly submitting to his rod. Again, what a statement. Think about it. Sounds like any time we act like adolescents, doesn't it? So you, you, you did the wrong thing. You chose to do the wrong thing. You discovered that there's suffering on the end of it. So then you act like a baby and complain against God instead of submitting to his rod. We've all been there and done that. Acting like foolish adolescents, unwilling to take responsibility. The good news is there is a way out. There is a way to be rescued from the deceitfulness of sin. And you know what we're back to, everybody? One thing. Anyone want to guess? It's humility. We're back to humility. That's the only reason, well, that's the main reason, that we suffer and continue to suffer. Because sometimes we think we're being humble, and in certain areas of our lives we're not. Because we're not submissive to His Word. That's how we can tell. We sin in a certain area, often gradually over time, and then we blame God for the results. When God promises to be gracious to us, if instead we turn to Him in humble repentance, but no, that's not what we do, right? We hold on. We justify. Our Heavenly Father longs to be merciful to us, he so wants to be merciful to us. But that depends on our free will. If we're willing to have a humble attitude before Him and take responsibility for our decisions and not act like an adolescent blaming others all the time. And we're all guilty. If we're honest, we know this. In certain areas of our lives, little things we hold on to, subtle things we hold on to, we all play the fool at times in certain areas of our lives. But then what is the question? On the board, playing the fool. We all do it at times. But instead of doubling up our foolishness, let's say, instead of living in self-pity and blaming God, we can receive His mercy by agreeing with God and humbling ourselves before Him. We need to stop playing the fool even if we've been foolish in a certain area of our lives, we, we shouldn't double down. We shouldn't enter into more misery, which would be self-induced by blaming God or resisting to agree with God fully about our disobedience. Proverbs 19.3, we've just seen. Uh, Luke 18.14, 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. 
Uh, you'll be familiar with some of these. James 4, 1 through 10, and 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Again, we all play the fool at times, but instead of living in self-pity and blaming God, we can receive His mercy by agreeing with God and humbling ourselves before Him. So first, let's turn to uh, Luke 18, verse 13. Luke 18, 13. <clears throat> As we've seen, uh, this point on the board is a rule of life that starts at salvation and continues through our sanctification as believers. It's a rule of life. We can't, we can't deny this or get around this, but it's a wonderful rule of life that is rewarding to the humble. Luke 18, 13, But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, said Jesus, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that is a salvation passage. Again on the board, we all play the fool at times. But instead of living in self-pity and blaming God, we can receive his mercy by agreeing with God and humbling ourselves before him. So turn with me to our next passage in 1 Peter 5, verse 5. 1 Peter 5, 5. We're back to humility. If we're willing to humble ourselves before him, even in those areas that we cling to in our lives, where we know we're failing, like over and over, Really, the core issue is we're remaining arrogant in that area of our lives. We're resisting God. 1 Peter 5.5 5, You younger men, likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time. And here's a passage that brings several things together. Things which we've been discussing so far in this series on the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, turn in your Bibles to James 4, verse 1. James 4, verse 1. Now you might be familiar with this passage, or at least some of it. But let's read it in context keeping in mind the principle from Proverbs 19, verse 3 on the board. Remember this principle in this verse on the board as we read James 4. On the board, Proverbs 19, 3. The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. Look at James 4, 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? What a great question. Look how it starts. What is the source? Who are you blaming for your problems and struggles, in other words? What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? 99% of the time, right? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. There's another aspect of deceitfulness of our sin natures. We talk ourselves into the fact that we're doing the right thing for the right reasons, When often, if we're honest and we examine our motivations, we're doing it for selfish reasons. Why? Because the sin nature is that deceptive. We even convince ourselves we're doing it for the right reasons. When way in the back of your head, you know that you you want to agree with verse 3. You ask with the wrong motives so that you can spend it on your pleasures. 
way in the back of your mind, you know that's why you helped the lady across the street. <laughs> Some deviant way to, you know, spend it on your own pleasures. Maybe to get a tip. Maybe other people are watching. Whatever. We can go on and on. That's religiosity, by the way. That's our religious side, the sin nature panders to, and says, you're doing this for the right reason, right? We talk ourselves into it. We're so foolish, right? <laughs> Back to verse 1. What is the source of your problems? Verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. There's our base problem right there. You think you're humble, but you're unwilling to submit to God in a certain area of your life. You're being arrogant. There's our base problem, even as believers. We're unwilling to submit to God and His ways in certain areas of our lives. And God's trying to help us let it go. Stop deceiving ourselves in certain areas that we're being humble, in an area where we're not submissive. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Merry Christmas, right? Sound familiar? Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Why? Because it leads to true good in our lives. Look at verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Humility is a real thing. Like, if we humble ourselves before God, if we submit to Him, there's a real fruit and a real reality in your life and in your heart when you do that. And you know what it first brings? Mourning and gloom. Because you are finally admitting the depths of your sin, maybe, or your, uh, your guilt against God, your disobedience to God in a certain area, you're finally admitting that, and guess what it brings? Sorrow. And you know what? That's wonderful, because now you can be brought back up by the Lord, and He can exalt you. We all want to be exalted or promoted, right? That's why we sin, because we want to rush blessings into our lives. We all want to be exalted or promoted, but it's subtly on our own terms, at least in certain areas of our lives. But God says, if you will turn to me and, and you're honestly willing to do it my way, I'll exalt you at the proper time. And it will be legitimate. It will be real and lasting and satisfying because it's from me. No more self-induced misery. No more wallowing, right? and self-pity, and blaming God very subtly. But why, God? We want it on our own terms. But only when we honestly humble ourselves before the Lord in each area of our lives, yeah, it might be sad at first, but He's then able to exalt you and lift you up. And it's for real. Turn to 1 John 1, verse 5, as we continue... Uh, with the point on the board that we started with. Let's see if we can find that again. Playing the fool. We can receive His mercy by agreeing with God and humbling ourselves before Him. Look at John 1, uh, 1 John, I'm sorry, 1 John 1, 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in the darkness, 
we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, that means, again, to agree with God about our sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That reminds me of Adam in the garden, right? He didn't admit his sin. He wasn't willing yet. He was basically calling God a liar, blaming God. So which will you continue to do going forward in the new year? Will you deceive yourself and deny the truth, indirectly calling God a liar? Or will you confess your sins in humility and allow him to cleanse you and set you free to go forward in a life of grace and righteousness? This came out from the Spirit on Sunday. The sin nature is so very deceitful, it convinces us that the real issue isn't with the fruit of our unrighteousness, rather that it's somehow our Creator's fault, like we just read in verse 10. The sin nature is so very deceitful, it convinces us that the real issue isn't with the fruit of our unrighteousness, rather that it's somehow our Creator's fault. This is the nature of sin that the Spirit's been trying to get us to see. The nature of sin and the nature of Satan's lies. Anything to quell the burning conscience within us so that we can just keep living the life the way we want to and end up suffering for it. But that just leads to more and more misery. We have to beware of the trap of self-justification. And this is why, like Pastor asked us to do on Sunday, we have to examine ourselves to see where sin is exploiting us. Because I'm willing to bet we all have an area of our lives that we're self-justifying right now. We don't see it because we're unwilling to see it. But are you willing to now examine your lives and see where maybe your motives are wrong? See where maybe sin has been taking advantage of you? drawing you in with small things, no big deal things that lead you down a path of destruction and reaping what you sow. We've got to be on guard for self-justification. But to do that, we have to examine ourselves. We can talk ourselves into anything, let's face it. We're pretty good at it because we've done it all our lives, being born in sin. And why do we do it? Let's be honest about why we do it to enable ourselves to continue in a lifestyle that satisfies our own lusts, whatever those might be. That's why we self-justify. You could have a lust for shopping, for spending money. You could have a lust for anything. It could be anything. And sin is willing to do anything to keep its little binky in place, to not give it up. Sin will deceive you to the nines so that you can just hold on to your little binky. It's not a big deal. Whatever that little lust may be that you refuse to let go of. And for this end, the flesh is even willing to blame the Creator for its own bad decisions. Even subtly blaming Him by asking why. But the Bible says God is the source of good. As we know, God is the source of good. He's not the source of evil. All good things come from Him, but bad things come from sin itself. We could trace it all the way back to the sin nature. We could trace it back to the total depravity that we're born in. And we will see it if we're willing to trace it back. And it's painful at first. Your laughter is going to be turned into mourning for a while your joy to gloom for a while. 
But if you humble yourselves before the Lord in that way, He can exalt you, like for real, and change your life and change your heart in that area and set you free from the bondage. That's what I'm looking forward to this year, in the new year. We were given an important reminder on Sunday on why we mustn't blame God for the pits we end up in. Turn in your Bibles again to James 1.13. <clears throat> God is good and He's the source of good. We mustn't blame God for the pits we end up in, even though we often subtly do so. James 1.13 Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and He Himself does not tempt anyone. That's the truth. Also from Sunday on the board, a person who takes the unholy tact of blaming God for his problems has a serious case of deceit in them. And since God is not the author of deceit, it must be sin that's responsible. Our sin nature wants us to think God chooses to overlook our sins because He loves us. And that God might even make special provisions for us, choosing to overlook our disobedience because He knows our weaknesses. Now, the Lord understands our weaknesses. That's for sure. He understands them better than we understand them. He became a man. He was tempted in every area, yet without sin, in Hebrews 4.15. So he does understand our weaknesses. He understands what we're going through. Yes. But he doesn't agree with or compromise with our sin because he loves us. That would be like misappropriating that, that reality. That he understands our weaknesses. He sure does. He can empathize with everything we're going through. And feeling and thinking but he doesn't agree with or compromise with our sin because he loves us. That's called partiality, as we saw on Sunday. That's also called being a bad parent. Do you really want God to be a bad parent, a bad father to you? If so, ask for partiality, ask for special treatment. Just think about the families you know where the parents give free passes to their kids, enabling them to develop bad habits and hurt themselves for years to come. Doesn't it hurt you when you see that? You could like see the writing on the wall, the way some parents just, you know, give their kids license to do whatever they want basically on the name of love, but really it's abuse. It's really child abuse. It's like enabling them to do things that that are just going to down the road destroy their lives. Partiality is, is what a bad parent does. We should be thanking God for the truth on the board in Romans 2.11. There's no partiality with God. We should be thanking God for that, even though it hurts at times, right? <laughs> what, what child wants discipline? But a mature child wants discipline because we know the good fruit that's going to come from it, right? The peaceful fruit of righteousness. That's related in that passage. I think it's... Hebrews 12, we should be so happy that God is not partial with us, that he's not going to play favorites. Otherwise, we would destroy ourselves. Do you, do you know what I mean? When, I hope you personalize this. If God let us get away with our sins, so to speak, if there was no divine discipline from him as a good father, we would destroy ourselves. Look at some of the misery you live with now from your decisions some of the results, some of the reaping what you sow. Can you imagine if God was partial towards you and out of love ignored certain things that you do that you might even refuse to confess? You would destroy yourself. As we've learned in the past, partiality leads to subjectivity and that leads to a lack of righteousness in our lives because we move the line back and forth 
to where sin wants it. That's subjectivity. And then we have a miserable life. But this came out also on Sunday. Subjectivity is the base cause for emotionalism. And once emotionalism leads knowledge, man is free to speculate any way he so desires regarding the things of God. Welcome to religion in America. That right there is what's going on in the majority of churches probably. Or at least with people that say they believe in God, they might not go to church. They say they believe in God, but they want God on their terms, their own subjective terms and definitions. And emotionalism leads knowledge. And man, therefore, speculates any way he wants to regarding the things of God. Self-justification. So right there on the board, we see the nature of sin. That's how it operates. That's how it functions. It deceives us. So we, uh, we fall into this trap. It starts with subjectivity. Then emotionalism, emotionalism goes ahead of knowledge instead of behind knowledge where it belongs. And then we speculate to our heart's delight, thinking we're in the good. And we're deceived. We're in the darkness. We think we're in the light. However, as we've learned recently on the board regarding integrity, objectivity exists in the absence of partiality. We cannot make special rules for those we love, including and starting with ourselves. That's our biggest problem. We love ourselves too much. That's the sin nature wanting to get what we want to get. Jesus despises us. He's like, do you want the truth or do you want life your way? And then on Sunday, the Spirit addressed the big white elephant in the room. The big question, how do even well-intentioned believers get caught up in subjectivity, partiality, and the deceitfulness of sin? We've seen this in Proverbs 4, 13 through 15. The short answer, I believe, is we refuse to be humble before the Lord. Truly humble. We refuse in some areas of our lives. We refuse to give over our lives to Him, to the one who purchased it. We want to selfishly hold on to our own lives and lifestyles, which plainly is called arrogance. Let's admit what it is. We're being arrogant when we hold on to certain areas where we're unwilling to submit to God. We refuse to obey the word which tells us in Proverbs 4, avoid it. Don't go on that path. Turn away from it. Pass on. Remember that verse? That's what the Word says. And what do we do? We, 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 we dangle with it. We play with it. We look. I, I can go on this side of the street. I'm strong. I just want to see what's going on. I'm just curious. And then what happens too? This came out on Sunday. This is kind of big. We often get tired and worn down. I don't know about you, but when I'm tired, I'm vulnerable. I'm susceptible. I'll give in. We even fall into arrogance and self-justification more when we're tired, don't we? But we know that whenever we let our guard down, for whatever reason, that's one reason, sin sneaks in. It's waiting for opportunities to do something against God, to not bring glory to God. So some great wisdom came out on Sunday regarding not putting ourselves in that position. And I don't know if you caught it, but I did. Get some sleep. Get more sleep. <laughs> and it might sound kind of foolish, but um, I've, might have, I've shared this with you in the past, I believe. On really bad days, when I have a really bad day, I on purpose go to bed early. I won't even brush my teeth. I'll just dive into bed. I got to forget about this one. I got to put this in the past. Knowing that His grace is new and fresh in the morning, right? Thank God for that, right? On those bad days you can just put behind you, 
thank God we can go to sleep. So we started with that tonight, <clears throat> looking forward to what lies ahead. His grace is new and fresh every morning. How about this idea? Take a nap, All right? Any of you like that idea? Some of you are like, yeah, that's great. Some of you are like, that's so stupid. But this doesn't mean be lazy. Take two-hour naps every day, right, so you don't work. This doesn't mean that. But here's what we're talking about in context, right? If you know you're susceptible to temptation because you're tired, take a nap. Stop trying to be the hero. Stop trying to, um, whatever, you're almost boasting in your flesh in a way. I can get through this. Take a nap. Do what you got to do to not be in a vulnerable position. And don't be embarrassed or ashamed about taking a nap like I was when I was younger, right? Your young, young person, oh, I don't need a nap, and that's for old people and this and that. Maybe, just maybe, it's wisdom saying get out of the bad situation or get out of a susceptible situation because you know when you're tired, you're weak. So what are you going to do about it? How are you going to change your habits in this new year? Are, are you going to change anything? Are you willing to change anything? Or are you going to stay in your stubborn arrogance that you can handle it and stay on the side of the road, you know? We can't handle it. And the more we're willing to admit we're weak, the more he'll make us strong, right? That's just how it goes. But you've got to be humble to admit how weak you really are and how unable you really are in your flesh. And here's what we'll close with tonight. Um, I'm not going to get through everything I want to, but you know yourself. And we're all different. We're all slightly different in our souls. I originally wrote in my notes, we're all built differently. But we're not talking about physical, right? We're all built difficult, differently that way too, I guess. But we're all built differently soulishly. So you know yourself. You have to listen to what you know about yourself. You have to be aware of that. Kind of like examining yourself, right? For where the, where the sin takes advantage of you. You know yourself. So avoid positions that make you vulnerable to sin. And this is why what's good for one person or okay for one person might not be good for you and vice versa. You know yourself. Obey what the Spirit is telling you in your conscience about yourself. Conscience. And where you're weak. Obey Him. Don't shut Him out. Consider taking a nap when you know you need to be recharged and avoid giving into sin when you're tired. Consider that form of surrender even. I'm too weak to handle this, Lord. Thank you so much for sleep. I'm going to enjoy the blessing of a nap. And uh, I don't know about you, but many times I've gotten up from that short little nap and feel totally refreshed, not vulnerable anymore, ready to go, like filled with the Spirit again. So just something to think about. Um, I'm going to have to close a little bit earlier than I wanted to, but also just think about, you know, the cumulative effect of little sins. This has been on my heart lately, personally, that God's been showing me the cumulative effect of a lot of little decisions, you know, that we think are no big deal. Do you remember it uh, came up a couple weeks ago? Have you thought about the fact that you probably watch television almost every single day for 30 years? How can that not have an effect on us? And what is that? That's no big deal, right? It's one day, one program. 30 years of that, how can that not have a cumulative effect on you? And that's what sin lies to us about. It's like, just do these little things that are no big deal. They might not even be sinning in themselves. But if you know the path that takes you down or you know you're being brainwashed by something over time, slowly, then maybe you might want to change up your routine a little bit so you don't fall into the same pit of misery and deception that you do we all do in different areas of our lives because of what we've submitted to. So just a couple th things to think about, and we'll uh, continue with class on Thursday evening.
Father, we thank you so much for your word. It's just so enlightening. It lights our path. And we ask, Father, that you help us truly be humble before you in every area of our lives, to be submissive towards your word and your spirit. And show us the light, Father, so that we can see the truth, so that we can be set free as you've intended. That's what Christ died for, Father, to give us true freedom. Help us live in your word, in your truth, and help us bring it out, Father, to a lost and dying world that needs it so desperately. Help us to save people from religiosity, open their eyes to the truth that you're the only way and the truth and the life. And no one can get to you except through Christ. We ask your blessing upon us all as we leave this evening. It's in Christ's precious name we pray by the power of your spirit. Amen. Thank you.